students. Um, I'm Mrs. Johnson and I have Ms. Scurry here. We're going to be showing you how to have a book club discussion today. So we have chosen A Long Walk to Water as our discussion book and we are each going to show you how to do the different roles for your book club discussion. So we have our notebooks like you have, okay, and we have taken the time to do all five of the different roles. So I have the summarizer and the vocab leader sheet. Those are the ones that I'm going to be demonstrating. And then Ms. Darty has the literary leader and the discussion leader and the connector. So we're gonna be showing you how to do each one. If you have a group of two people, you will only be doing two roles. If you have four people, all of you will be doing different ones. You'll have four in total. But we'll be doing this five times, so you will have a chance to do each one no matter what. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to follow a certain order of roles. The summarizer is always going to go first. So that's me. Then the vocab leader, then the literary leader, then the connector, and then the discussion leader. So I'm going to start. Um, so I prepared a summary of the chapters. Um, we were supposed to read chapters one and two of A Long Walk to Water. Um, I was supposed to uh, keep track of some key points. Um, key point one was that we meet the two main characters, um, Naya and Salva. Salva has to leave his village because of some violence that happened. Um, he finds some other people from his village who are also fleeing the violence. They allow him to walk with them and he notices some rebels take the men away and force them to fight for them. And then Salva is abandoned by his group in a barn. So I wrote a summary based on those key points. Does my group want to hear the summary? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't quite remember what happened in chapter one, so if you could read the summary for me. Perfect, so I'll read the summary so that my group knows everything that happens in the reading, just in case someone didn't finish the reading. Here's my plot summary. A Long Walk to Water is a story about a boy and a girl living in South Sudan about 20 years apart. Salva, the boy, has to flee his village suddenly after an attack by the government and or the rebels. Salva is alone until he finds some other members of his village. He stays with them and sees the men in his group forced to join the rebels. Salva stays with the women and children, but they abandon him while he's sleeping in the barn. Oh, okay, thanks, that was really helpful. Yeah, so that's basically all the important things that happen. Next, um, if there's someone else in your group who is the vocab leader, they are gonna go next and they're going to tell you about the new vocab words that they learned. So, I found some interesting words. Um, one was the Dinka tribe. I've never heard that before. That's just, that's Salva's tribe. There's lots of different tribes um, and villages and he's from a tribe called the Dinka people. Um, I learned some new animals that I guess are native to Africa. A guinea hen is a kind of chicken and a grouse is like a small bird with like a fan out tail. I looked at pictures, it's pretty cool. Um, Islam is a religion that the government of South Sudan wants everyone to practice but they don't always want people to practice Islam, which is why there's so much contention. Um, Lone Arik is the name of Salva's village. I tried to look up what it, mean, what it means, but it's part, of a, it's part of a language in Africa that like only a few people speak, and so it's kind of hard to find the meaning of it, but I just wrote that it was his name, the name of his village. Then the word gleaning, um, like when he's pointing the gun at one of, uh, no, when he's pointing the gun at Salva and it says that the gun is gleaming, it doesn't mean that it's glowing, it means that it's smooth so it can reflect light. Um, and then I didn't know what the butt of a gun was, so I looked it up, <laughs> and it's the back part of the gun that's usually made of wood. I actually, I thought it was the tip of the gun, but it's not, it's the back part. So those are the words that I found. Oh, those are really interesting words. Thanks. So that's what the vocab person should do. Just go through all the words and describe what they mean. Awesome, so um, now I am gonna do the job of the literary so I chose three passages that I just wanted to talk about really quick. Um, my first passage is on page four. I'm gonna go with her to page four. So on page four, the one that I picked is the one where um, it's just talking about how all of the kids were building a fire. So it says some of them gathered wood to build a fire, others helped clean and dress the animal, then they roasted it on the fire. None of this took place quietly. Salva had his own opinion on how the fire should be built, 
and how long the meat needed to cook and so did the others. The fire needs to be bigger. It won't last long enough. We need more wood. No, it's big enough already. Quick, turn it over before it's ruined. Um, so I chose that one just because I felt like it showed how normal all of these kids were. Um, mm -hmm. And I felt like that was really cool because um, instantly Salva is thrown into this situation where he's in war. Um, so I just wanted to bring up that um, Salva had a normal childhood. So I wanted to ask everybody, um, do you guys think Salva's childhood was like yours or was it different? Well, Salva definitely was still afraid of war the way we all would be. Like they all ran at gunfire. They weren't used to like carrying guns around, I don't think. But at the same time, I mean, obviously the way he played with his friends was way different than how I would play with my friends. Like they would like hunt animals for fun and we I play video games for fun. Like it's very different. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. I just thought when I saw this that they were just being like normal kids arguing. So that's a very interesting perspective on that. Thanks. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys use this by the way? I think that might be blinking. I'm not sure if it's working. I think it's so. Is it working? Oh yeah. Okay. I'll just hold it closer. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, on page 11 is my next passage that I chose. Um, and I chose the one where the soldier uh, puts the gun in Salva's face because, and tells him that um, he's a boy. Um, and it's right after, I wanted to talk about the part where Salva is like, I'm the son of an important man. My grandfather was an important man. I need to step up. I need to be the man of my family now that I don't know where my family is. Um, and I just wanted to ask everybody, oh, it's just that. I got this. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask everybody um, if they felt like they would do that in this situation. Would you feel like you have the responsibility to represent your family? And would you, if somebody was pointing a gun at you, would you be like, yeah, I'm the man of the house. Like, I. I'm the man in this situation. <laughs> I really don't know. I'm, it's hard to relate, I guess, because I guess I relate more to the women in the situation. But um, I don't know. Maybe if it was something less serious, I would step up. <laughs> if it wasn't like a life or death situation, I don't know. Maybe the, at the last moment, maybe he just felt some pride. He's like, I want to go with the men. Like, wherever they're going, I would go there, I guess. I mean, I think the honest answer is that no, I wouldn't. I'd be too afraid, but that makes me think that Sal was pretty brave. Yeah, I said the same thing. I was talking to some people about it, and I said that I would 100% be like, I'm a kid, I'm a, I'm a kid here, I'm not a man. <laughs> so yeah, I agree, I thought that Sal was very really brave. Yeah. <laughs> you were like, I'll take a kid ticket. Kid, yes, kid 100%. So yeah, I, I definitely thought Sal was brave in that situation. Um, the last one that I picked was number 13. Um, and it's where Salva's in the barn and he just wakes up and uh, the last line on that page says he was alone. Um, so he's 11 years old and he's all alone in a war-torn country in this barn. Um, what would you do in that situation if you woke up all alone and you had no idea what to do? I don't know, that's a terrible part. I, I can't believe how I don't know, I feel like this, this culture that we're reading about is really just kind of survival based. Like, I didn't feel like there was a whole lot of compassion for Salva. I mean, he's this little kid, but I guess everyone's just really worried about their own survival. Um, I think if I were him, I probably would have just done what he did, which was just like hang out in that barn as long as he possibly can. And he even, it says that he like tried to be helpful. Oh, in the next chapter. Oops, I read ahead a little bit. But um, I think, uh, yeah, I would just stay there hoping someone would come, I guess. I think in that situation, I might have tried to like go home. It probably would have been a dumb like choice, but I think I might have been like, I'm just going to turn around and start heading home and see if that gets me anywhere. Right. And it might have been a bad idea because there were people with guns last time I saw my village, but I might have tried to go home and be like, oh, home is my like safest direction, so. Yeah. Um, just as a follow-up question, do you think that at 11 years old, you, I don't know, 
you can be creative enough to like save yourself or do you think that 11 year olds really need parents? I feel like me at an 11, 11 years old, I would not have been creative. I, like I would have just sat on the floor and cried. But I feel like Salva is really grown up for 11 years old. Yeah, yeah. I do feel like what you brought up about the culture being um, a lot different from ours, I think they have had to grow up and mature and be a lot more independent faster than we have. Mm, that's neat. Um, the other thing that I had to do as literary leader was find any uh, figurative language. That you were sharing what figurative language is. Yeah, so figurative language is just um, similes, metaphors, um, alliteration, personification. So any of those that I saw, I just wrote down as I was reading. Uh, this was definitely a hard job, um, and I found a couple in this book. Um, I actually found two of the ones that I found were onomatopoeias. Oh, wow. Um, so onomatopoeias are sound words, which are like bang, boom. Um, so I found those on pages, they were kind of throughout the whole first part, but like oh. five and eight. Um, so like on page five, um, it says crack, pop, pop, crack, ack, 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 which was the sound of gunfire. And <clears throat> so I thought that the author put that in there to show how scary that those gun sounds would be. And there, yeah. I thought that he did that instead of just saying like, the gun fired, or like there were sounds of gunshots outside. I thought it kind of was a lot scarier to see those like all caps gun sounds on the page than just seeing like there was gunfire outside. Right, totally. So I thought it was really cool that the author actually put sound words in there. Um, so there were two on a lot of pieces. He put also on page eight, or sorry, she, the author is a woman. <laughs> um, <laughs> On page eight, um, it says boom. So there was some sort of explosion off in the distance. And same thing there. I thought it was just kind of like to show how scary those sounds were for Salva. Right. Um, and then on page eight as well, there was a simile. Um, it says, oh yeah, a jet plane veered away like a sleek evil bird. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, so it would be a metaphor. Um, and so I had, I thought that it was like a sleek evil bird. Um, to show that Salvo wasn't really trusting that jet, but I felt like he also didn't really know what the jet was. Oh, yeah, maybe. Like, I felt like maybe Salvo didn't have a ton to compare the jet to, so he was comparing it to, like, an evil bird. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, um, so I'm going to go on to my text connector role. Um, so my job as the text connector was just to connect um, Long Lost Water to different texts, so like other books or movies or music, um, to myself, and then to the world. Um, so another book that I connected this to was the book Refugee, um, which we're actually going to read next cool. quarter. Um, <laughs> so in the book Refugee, there's a boy in Syria uh, who loses his home, and he has to like run from place to place, and he just never feels safe, and so I feel like um, Salva's story is really similar to this boy's story, and just like as I was reading it, I was just like, oh my gosh, this sounds really similar. Um, so the two books are really similar there. Um, and then relating it to myself, um, this is definitely not as serious, but I was thinking about a time when I got lost and I was really scared. Um, so one time I got lost in the Mall of America, which is the biggest mall in America. It's in uh, Minnesota. And it was really scary. I got separated from my grandma for like half a second and she was just gone. And you thought you were alone. But I thought I was like lost. Well, and then she just left me because she's not very responsible. <laughs> it's like my, my mom. She'll have fun. She'll be fine. Yeah, my mom. She just left me. So she, uh, I was in the amusement park and I like sat there alone. I remember I was like petting a llama in the petting zoo, just like <laughs> crying because I thought I had been abandoned and I was never going to see my family again. Mama. Yeah, so I was like six, which probably was like, you know, like too young. And my grandma didn't, sh I don't even think she noticed I was gone. And so, yeah, she ended up coming back to me and she like wasn't like, oh, there you are, I'm so worried. She was like, why are you crying? Don't cry. Like I wasn't even gone that long. Let's go. And I was like, okay, oh my gosh. Well, that, well, that sounds a lot like the adults in this story. They're kind of like, look, fend for yourself. You'll be fine. Sorry about it. Yeah. 
So, I mean, it definitely isn't as serious as his situation, but I kind of related with him for the 10 minutes that Maybe I the was emotions were the same. Yeah. When you're a kid, you don't know. Maybe getting stuck in the Mall of America is really dangerous when you're a child and you just don't know where to go. Yeah, I so I just hung out with a llama for <laughs> 10 minutes. Find the llama. Yeah. Um, and then some text the world connections I made on. Um, there's actually um, a civil war going on in Sudan right now. Um, I'm not sure of the, like, um, the particulars. Yeah, of what's going on really. Um, but I saw an episode of a show on Netflix that was talking about it. Oh, wow. Um, and then I was just thinking about how many countries still don't have um, instant access to water. Um, that kind of relates to Naya's um, part in the story. And then the war in the civil war in Syria that took place in 2018 separated a lot of children from their families, just like we see in this book. Cool. Good connections. Yeah. So then I'm going to go to my discussion leader role. And I've just made up five questions here um, that we can talk about and go back and forth. Um, so my first one is, what do you think it would be like to be in a war zone without your family? Oh man, I think, I mean, the first thing I would probably look for, well, my family first, and then I would probably go looking for my friends or anyone else that I knew. Um, but it would be terrifying just because that's so different from the world that I live in. Everything is so secure, really. Um, but yeah, I think it would be totally terrifying. Um, what What kind of plan would you make to try and like link up with your family um, or your friends to try and find them? That's a good question. Um, I guess I would go, I mean, I would go home first, obviously. I would go home, I would look for my husband, um, and if I couldn't find him there, then, I mean, I bet a lot of people would be searching for their loved ones on Facebook, honestly, because, uh, I don't know, because sometimes, I mean, if you're looking for one person, there might be five other people that know where that person is if they can't get to their phone. So I would probably like put out a Facebook, like, has anyone seen <laughs> these people? And then I bet a lot of people would be networking that way. Um, I would probably go to like my local church building, because I know a lot of people would be there. Um, I don't know, or I might just like crawl up in a ball in my basement. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I might do that first, <laughs> and like get collected, and then do all those other things. <laughs> I think I've heard a lot of people say that like schools too are like a really good meeting place. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, it might be like a good idea to like go to a school too. So yeah, yeah. Um, my next question is more directed to Long Lost Water. Um, did the adults from Salva's village have a responsibility to help him? Like were they? So are you saying did the adults of his village should they have helped him? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> I think so. I think they should, but at the same time, and you see this later in the book, like, there's only so much water, so only, there's only so much food, um, so, like, if you take one person along, it means that another one of your group might die because there might not be enough food, so at the end of the day, you are making a choice between saving this person or maybe saving someone else, so that's just a really hard moral decision to make, I think, for anyone. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe people from like other villages might have less of a responsibility towards Salva. Like if they, almost like people like in our town. So like if I live in South Jordan, then, you know, I have more responsibility toward people from South Jordan. But like if I was in this situation, I might have less of a responsibility towards somebody from like Harriman or something. Yeah, so like, you might feel bonded to them. I think, it, you know what was interesting in the book was how the people, even though they didn't know each other, the people from the same village all of a sudden decided that they were going to be together because they had that one link. Yeah. They were all from the same village. And even Salva said, like, I didn't recognize anyone, but, or sorry, I didn't know anyone personally, but I recognized their faces, and so I decided to stay with them. So it's interesting how quickly we can make those connections as people. Like, we want to be together. Yeah, I agree. So I, I just felt like they kind of let him down and yeah. he they just left him behind even though you know they I felt like his parents weren't there so somebody in the village they've been kind of like his people for his entire life and they kind of just were like yeah okay bye Salva maybe it was Hannah 
I mean, people act differently when they're panicked and when they're fearful than I think they would if they were comfortable. And so it's interesting to see people make these decisions that they wouldn't normally make, but because it's so scary, they do. That's true. I hadn't considered that. They, I mean, they're adults, but it's a really scary situation. So they might not have, I mean, they were kind of just thinking about surviving, not necessarily that they were abandoning Salva. Whereas we're reading from Salva's point of view, so we're really focusing on him. Um, my next question is, Salva says not many people in his village get to go to school. Is he taking his education for granted by not paying attention in class? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, that was, yeah, that was interesting. I felt weird reading that to my students because I was like, well, here's our main character not paying attention to school. <laughs> but um, I think it just shows how realistic of a character he is. I mean, he's a good kid. He seems like he's a good kid. But at the same time, just like any other 11-year-old boy, it's hard, or girl, it's hard to pay attention in school all the time. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether it's in the U.S. or in Africa. And I think that's why he opened the book that way, because it's fun, uh, worse. He wanted to reach out to students living here and connect with them about at least one thing. Like, even though this, this boy Salva lives in Africa, he's a lot like you, because you probably have a hard time paying attention in school, too. Yeah, okay, I didn't think about it that way. I was just like, Salva, pay attention. But I was looking at it from kind of like a teacher's point of view. But looking at it from like a student's point of view, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah. Um, my next question is, um, this one sounds kind of harsh. Is Salva being too immature by wondering where his family is all the time? Like, should he just kind of like suck it up and like get moving? Or, cause like he's asked, where is my family? Like 11 times. Yeah, already. Um, so should he, suck it up or is it just something to be expected? I think I think it's pretty realistic for an 11 year old, but I don't know, maybe our students know better than we do because they're closer to that age, but I think at 11 years old I would be pretty obsessed with finding my mom and dad. Because I mean like there's nothing else, at 11 years old you don't know how to build a house or like I mean, his mom made him a bowl of milk every day. I mean, he was basically still having her prepare everything for him, right? Except for when he would hunt animals. So I don't know. It's just kind of hard to know because he's from a different culture than we are. Yeah, I just, I felt like he was so mature because he did, he does, it does talk about how he can like make a fire and how he can hunt animals. So I was like, come on, Salvi, you can do all these things. You're so capable, like, just, Come on, pull yourself together and like, let's go. You can do this. Oh, like all kinds of shivers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on, it's a canoe or whatever. <laughs> a, uh, uh, a grouse. A <laughs> grouse. Yeah. Go get a grouse, Salva. Yeah. But so I think, um, I think on one hand he is like really mature for his age. But yeah, you do have to consider that he's 11 years old and that he can, that he is like missing his family. I'm pretty sure I would be like. Where's my family? Like, oh my gosh, I'm all by myself. I think I would like link up with a group and I would be like, do not leave me. Like, where, where are you guys going? Are you going You're to the bathroom? I'm coming with you. Like, <laughs> I'm not staying here by myself. So I'm pretty sure that like, even even if it happened to me like right now, I would go with them. I, he's like not even at 11, so. Yeah, that's true. Um, my last question is, um, should Salva have ignored the teacher's warning and gone home anyway? to like try and find his family and like link up with them since it's been such a major concern for him. I feel like the teacher was spot on when he said don't run home. <laughs> um, and I think in that split moment, I mean everyone's terrified, right? They're all like, they have their hands over their heads and there's all this noise and commotion going on. And I think given all that's going on, you just take the first bit of advice that someone gives you and you're like, oh, okay, run that way? Okay, I'm running that way. You know, just like do, because they don't know what to do. Um, I don't think he expected to get separated from his family for so long. I think he knew, okay, I'll run this way and then I'll come back. He didn't know he would be separated permanently. Yeah, I just feel like that maybe if it wouldn't have been, if he might have like, just maybe have gone back and like found somebody, like found a brother or something, that it may have been like just a little bit 
just a little bit better. Or like maybe if the teacher had just said like grab a buddy or something. Yeah, right. Then he could have had at least somebody his age who knew what he was going through. But like the teacher was just like just run, and so it just turned into like a free for all. So it's kind of like hard not to be like. What? Like this? <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe you students don't know this, but as teachers, if we're ever, ever in a situation like that where the building is not safe, I think we're supposed to tell them to just run away from the building. Am I wrong on that? I mean, we, I was actually talking about this with some of my students, and I was like, I'm pretty sure I would get in trouble for that because, I mean, I think running away from the building, but I think I would have to still be responsible for them. I wouldn't just kind of like send them off into. I would like, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't just be like, take off. I would be like, stay with me. Like, let's go. We'll all try and like get out and we'll stay together. And yeah. like, but what I, if you have to stay behind and like fight off the person or fight off the danger? I mean, it, that would be a different situation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then I would send them off, but like, right. yeah. It depends, right? You have to make that split second decision. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So. So that was our full book club meeting. We went through all the different roles. Um, and again, if you only have two people in your group, you only go through two of these roles. 